Um, there are some links in there that you're going to follow, so it'd be useful to have that up. It's uh, tinyurl.com, and the alias is comp stem for computation in stem. Uh, so load that up. If you have any trouble, we'll get to it a little bit later. Welcome. The idea behind this, the thing that motivates this workshop, is the idea that there's a lot of opportunity to use computation in the curriculum, in the engineering curriculum, math and science, and also in other disciplines that aren't math, science, and engineering. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are opportunities out there. Uh, especially engineering. I think we're going to be focused on engineering because that's where we're coming from. But part of what we want to do with the workshop is pull a lot of ideas in from other disciplines. I'm going to be finding out more in a minute about where you all are coming from. That's one of the first sheets in the uh, uh, packet that you have at the tables. So we'll get to that in a minute. We're going to do this in a little bit of a funny order, which is to start with the assumption that there are no obstacles. Everything is wonderful. We'll think about what the opportunities are, and then we'll come back and think about the obstacles. So to introduce Jason, you want to say a little bit about what you're working on? So I'm uh, faculty in the mechanical and aerospace engineering here. I'm a LPSOE, so I focus on teaching, and i um, been working on introducing a lot of computational thinking and ideas in uh, the classes that I teach, and I'm hoping to spread it to our department and, and uh, further in college engineering, and hopefully wider too. So I'll talk a little later. And... All right, thanks. Uh, and I'm coming from Olin College. This is a new school. I'm actually curious to know how many of you have heard of Olin. Oh, okay, that's pretty good. It's small and it's new. It was, we started up about 20 years ago with the mission of fixing engineering education, which is kind of a provocative way to put it because it kind of suggests that everything is broken and we're trying to change everything. And that's not entirely the case, but a lot of things that we're working on, one of them is this idea of uh, bringing computation into the engineering curriculum. And that's the primary project that I'm working on is this book series that is uh, called Think, Think X, where the X can be any value. The idea is that I'm taking a computational approach to various topics in an idiosyncratic order, starting with things that I know about and gradually moving farther and farther into things that I don't actually know about. So digital signal processing, for example, is something that I really learned about by writing the book, using computation as a way of teaching myself. This is the quick outline for the workshop. We're, we have four hours. I think we'll be here for most of it. But I think we've got it scheduled in a way that the time will fly. You will, you'll be amazed. Um, roughly one each, each hour, we will uh, talk a little bit, you will have some activities that you'll do. You're mostly going to work in small groups, so I'm going to rearrange you just a little bit so that you're all at tables in the group. And then we'll have a few breaks. We have a longer break at the midpoint where we have some coffee and some, do we have snacks or coffee? We've got some things coming in. So the first session, the first hour, is a little bit of framing for what we're headed, headed into. The first sheet that I mentioned on the packet we would like to find out a bit more about you all, and you'll find out about the people that you're sitting with. I have an example in each hour we have a computational example that comes from one of our classes that we're going to show you something that we do and you are going to reverse engineer it and think about why we're doing it the way we're doing and what works and what doesn't work. And then the framework that we're going to lay out is the seven ways of using computation, which are just different categories that we've thought about for uh, injecting computation into existing material, and I'll explain what the fill in the matrix thing means when we get to it. So, part of this is we'll lay out this framework and you are going to fill it in. Um, for each of these seven categories, you can think about whatever class you're currently teaching or something that you might create in the future. And if there are things that you're already doing, we're going to gather some information from you about that but also then use this as a chance to brainstorm things that you're not currently doing, but hopefully we'll get some ideas going. Two things to think about when we're designing, if you're designing a curriculum, you know, think of it like a design problem. Who are the stakeholders? Who are you designing for? One part of this, let's 
model your students as an idealized model temporarily, and then we'll refine the model later. But for now, let's assume that they are coming into your class and they have a moderate level of programming skill in a general purpose programming language. So MATLAB or Python or whatever are the language that, that you're using. Let's just assume they have basic programming skills coming in. So that's a solved problem. How would you use that? That's how I want to frame this opportunity. At the end, we'll talk about, well, okay, that's not true, so how are we going to deal with that? The other thing to keep in mind when you're designing a class is that you are a stakeholder as well. The curriculum that we as a faculty design, we then have to figure out how to deliver. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the obstacles there as well. In some ways, our training is not well aligned for the kind of curriculum work that we want to do. So I'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about ways that we can deal with that. But again, starting out with an idealized model, let's assume for now that you and your colleagues have all of the programming and software engineering skills and computational science skills. Let's just assume that you know what you need to know. And don't think of that yet as being a barrier. We'll think about making that true later. The examples that we're going to use are mostly Python, but I don't want to make this into a sort of Python evangelism event. I think it's good language, but everything that we're talking about today works in pretty much any language. Not to say that there aren't differences. There are diff definitely pros and cons for the technologies that you choose, but by and large, if you are a MATLAB or an R person or even C, Java, it'll be okay. Ideally, when we're done, you will have some ideas about things that you could go do immediately, like in the semester that starts next week. <laughs> um, but also, I hope, some bigger picture ideas about curriculum design that's not just things that you're doing as an individual in your class, but things that might span classes across your programs. So the first thing I want to do is gather a little bit of data. We're not going to go around the room and hear from everybody just because I would love to hear more, but it's not the, the most efficient use. But I do want to use the work packets that you've got. So you should have at your table uh, a stack of eight sheets of paper. So each of you should have one of those clipped uh, stacks. If you are at a table, we have tables that are kind of set up for three or four people. So if we can get three people at each of these tables that are set up for people, I think that'll just about make the numbers work. So I think that means everybody over there should move over to one of these tables. So you've got eight sheets of paper. Seven of them are the seven ways of using computation in the curriculum. We'll get to those in a minute. The first one is the who are you. And I want to use this partly to gather data and partly to get you using the tools that we've put out, which are the Sharpies and the Post-its. Part of the reason for that is if you are writing with a Sharpie on a piece of paper like this, it kind of forces you to write big which forces you to not use a lot of text. It also gives you the opportunity to draw some pictures, which can be a great way to represent some projects that you're working on or things that you're interested in. You also have the option of writing directly on the paper if you feel like you're ready to commit, or writing on post-its, which are a convenient way to make elements that you can then move around and crumple up and throw away and arrange. So if you take a couple minutes to make the one sheet that answers the questions that are posed there, and we'll come around and just chat a little bit to find out who you all are, and then we'll get back into it in about five minutes. Okay, let's reconvene. You will have a chance to finish up in a minute. If, if, if I've interrupted you, you'll have a chance to finish. I want to start the next thing that we're doing, and then you can overlap a little bit. The next example, or maybe the first example, class, come to order, please. 
<laughs> so I'm going to pull an example from one of my classes and, and the book that I mentioned about uh, digital signal processing. This is one of the first examples that a student would see if they come in to take digital signal processing. It's meant to be kind of a light introduction. Um, and you're going to have two ways to run this. This is a Jupyter notebook. If you're not familiar, if you've used Python, you can write Python programs that run in a standard kind of uh, execution environment. There are also these Jupyter notebooks that look like uh, the MATLAB notebook, or they look like the Mathematica notebook, where you have uh, text and uh, cells that contain code, and then you execute the cells, and then you see the output from whatever, you know, whatever the execution was. So we're going to walk you through one of those. You've got two ways to do this. If you've got a UC Davis account, you're going to be able to use the URL that Jason is putting up there, which is running on a Jupyter Hub. So what you'll be running on your laptop is a browser that's connected to a server that's in Jason's office under his desk, as I recall. <laughs> um, and that's running the Jupyter server there. If you don't have, a, and, and Jason, you're going to explain how all that works in just a second. If you don't have a UC Davis account, you won't be able to log in there, but you will be able to use Binder, which is a similar service that's actually run out of a lab in Texas. And they will start up a virtual machine that's going to run the notebook. So if you don't have a UC Davis account, follow that link. And when you get there, Call me over, and I'll just walk you through how to get to where you want to be. And Jason, you're going to run through how to contact that. Okay, so if you have a UC Davis account and you signed up for the workshop, we enabled you to use this service, if I can get to it. Um, Bicycle.ucdavis.edu. So I have this service set up that um, you can log into, use your UC Davis email address, and once you log in, you should see something like this. <clears throat> what you're going to want to do is, there's an assignments tab here, and you should see Comp Think Workshop. And that assignments tab, and then you fetch that assignment. So if I click Fetch, and then I return to the Files tab, you have to refresh your browser, unfortunately, but you refresh your browser, and notice I have a folder here, Comp Think Workshop. So I can click that folder, and then inside of here, these Jupyter Notebooks have an extension, IPYNB. We have two of them here. The one that Alan's going to show you is this cacophony.ipynb. So if you click that, you're going to get to the notebook this notebook, and that's where we want to get you. If you need help, uh, Kenny, Ben, and Alan, and I can all help you navigate there too, so just raise your hand if you um, didn't get all of those steps, but you will be able to interact with and run this notebook. Are you going to take it with you? Yep. All, right. all right, so if you're doing that, they're going to help you out with all of those steps. If you're using Binder, I will walk you through that, and then I'll help you out if you have any trouble. What's the URL Bicycle 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 That's why you So this is what you'll see if you click that binder button. You'll see that page. It just created a virtual machine. And now this is Jupyter. And if you click cacophony.ipynb, you'll open that notebook. And then once people have a notebook open, I will give you a little bit of instruction in how to use the notebook. The one crucial piece of information that you need is that to execute a cell, if you hit shift return. And so you can work your way through the notebook, just read the text, read the code, and then hit shift return. And if you just keep hitting shift return, it'll walk you through the notebook, it'll execute the code, and you'll see the output. As soon as you start to have fun. So to pull it back in, I want to ask a few questions about 
this activity that you just did. So you've just had the experience of a student working at least with this computational environment. And part of the reason we wanted to show you Jupyter Hub and the notebook is that this is an environment that you can put students in that is fairly painless to get them mm -hmm. from nothing at all to running code and seeing how the code works. So you didn't have to install anything. You had to follow a few links, but you're in the programming environment pretty quickly. If you've signed up, if you've taken workshops and things where you have to install some software ahead of time or you've created a programming environment for yourself, you know that that can be painful. And if you've taken students through that process, you know that it's a rough way to start the semester because all of their attention is focused on being system administrators and creating the environment and no cognitive capacity is available for the stuff that you're actually trying to achieve. So that was one reason we wanted to show you this example. But now thinking about what you just read through, I want you to reflect a little bit and we'll have a conversation. What, if anything, did you learn? And I'm curious to maybe find out how much you all know about signal processing and how much of this was familiar or not. And what you might have done with something like this in a class. Is there a particular topic that you would use this for or a class that you might introduce it to? And what goal might you achieve? What kind of, what, if anything, is this useful for? So thoughts, I'm curious, maybe starting with the first question, is this new to you? Did you learn anything? Anybody feeling brave? So I, I, I give my students, uh, I, I do very similar things in my class. We look at frequency analysis of signals. Mm -hmm. uh, and I give them examples to go work and show them kind of do a demo, me doing working something on the board, uh, and we do it a hard way in Excel, and we kind of do it an easy way in that lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have homework problems where they're supposed to go work that. And you know, you lose a few students in between, of course. And so here, I think having them be able to work through an example kind of on their own and jump through the pieces is pretty, pretty useful. Mm -hmm. Nice. You said something interesting there. You said the hard way and the easy way. Mm -hmm. Do you do it in that order? I do, yeah. Yeah, because I think that's actually one of the things we'll talk about a little bit. Because you can you can do that in either order, and there are pros and cons yeah, sure. of doing that. So that's, that's nice that that came up. Mm -hmm. okay. Other thoughts? Thinking about it from the student's point of view, if you came into a class, and let's pretend that this was day one, and all you did was run through that notebook, did you learn anything? Or what can you imagine a student might get out of that? Yeah? I think you start to match some of the code to the concepts. So mm -hmm. even as you're learning the concepts, you're seeing the code that's related to the concept as yeah. you go. So when you start to be the place where you're going to generate code, you've had some familiarity with it. But if you didn't understand all the syntax or all the code, you still couldn't understand it. And right. The, the signal processing aspect of it. Yep. Yeah, so there's a little bit of, you said, the correspondence between the code and the concepts that you're seeing right away, even if, even if you don't know Python. Right. And I'm curious how many people in the room don't know Python? Okay, good. So you have, that's your point of view then is, I don't know what this program does, but I'm getting a hint about it. Interesting. Other thoughts? Yeah. So. I think why this is one of the reasons this is powerful is because you can sort of see how things work and it builds up step by step. And my brain immediately goes to trying to decipher what's happening there and kind of read the code even though I don't know Python. Yep. And, and but I, I wonder how typical that is for for a typical student, and how many students get lost at that at that point. I mean, if universally everybody's on the same page trying to dig in and understand, then I think there's a lot of learning going on. I just wonder if you're losing half the students when you do. That's a good, yeah, because that's when you see something like this that you don't fully understand, there are two responses to that. And right. One is, you know, I'm comfortable, I'm moving along, I'm getting it kind of, and I can fill in details later. Yeah. The other is, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in panic mode because I'm seeing things I don't understand, and that's bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think this would be really intimidating to like a biologist, mm -hmm. where computation is important in biology. Um, but just looking at all these code blocks would be intimidating. Yep. 
Yeah, so the, the, but it sort of draws you in because like the answer is there. And you get this result. Yeah, you, so you, you can kind of you can skip accessible. over it, right, mm -hmm. and not engage with it. Mm -hmm. But also sometimes you might be like, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. I don't understand. There's all this code stuff here. They must think that I'm supposed to understand this, um, but I don't. And like that, as you say, like the panic mm -hmm. sets in, depending on the experience of the people that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think one thing that I've always appreciated about using coming from a, a biology background is um, the the degree to which it's broken down. Right, I think a lot of people present things often in this format as just sort of here's a block of code, a large block of code. This is going to give you some output at the end, given some input. But the level, the degree to which you break it down, I think, is a way to fine tune how people view it, and I think doing visualization of the data in between, like doing lots of plotting steps after each manipulation of the data, I think is a, like a really, something that when I was first learning stuff really helped it click for me, because, you know, I don't know, we're still working with data, and I mean, regardless of our background, and we're probably used to viewing it in certain ways, so when you see code, and then you see, oh, this distribution shifted in this way, or oh, this data frame shifted in this way, you can sort of start to step through it, I think. And I, I like the degree to which this was broken down. I mean, some of the functions that get defined, you know, are a little long by necessity. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the degree to which you can kind of see like, oh okay, we're going to stepwise, you know, each chunk going through it, it helps you process it mm -hmm. in a more digestible way. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a there's a computational framework that's implicit in this notebook that becomes the primary tool that the students start with. And I'm actually going to get a diagram up now because we're going to come back to this which is they see, in this notebook, they see uh, an object that's called a uh, signal. And an object that's called a wave. And they see this method called make spectrum that takes a wave and creates a spectrum object. And then later on, they're going to find out that that arrow actually goes both ways. So implicitly, they've got some conceptual material here, which is this correspondence between a wave in the time domain and a spectrum in the frequency domain, <coughs> which is probably like 90% of the class right there is about that, that arrow. And they're seeing the set of computational objects that we're going to keep coming back to. Um, and this is going to come up in just a couple of minutes. So I don't want to you know, belabor this example too much. Any last thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah. So when people go into panic mode, I think I was kind of referring to the same reaction you might get from mechanical yeah. theory. You know? yeah. uh, it's not just biology. <laughs> For sure. Uh, can you smell it as an instructor? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so well, you have some tools and techniques for dealing with that. Um, well, I think part of the challenge there is if you are showing them a bunch of stuff and you are expecting them to understand part and you're expecting them to be comfortable not understanding another part, right. you just have to make sure they know which parts are which. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that is, it, you know, there's still going to be some discomfort there, yeah. but I think that's a key. And, and I'm very sympathetic to, if my expectation as a student is that I understand what's being put in front of me, I don't like it very much when you say, well, I'm going to show you this, but you're not really going to get it. I, do, I try to avoid being in that mode as much as sure. I can. But when I am, I'm explicit about, it, you know, don't panic, it's OK. That's all. That's, I, I was wondering how you would present this in a class. Because I think how you present it, you yeah. know, the motivation for it, if you say, here's the thing, and I have these code blocks, and they're going to demonstrate these concepts, and we're going to get into this in a little bit. What I want you to do right now is look at it and try it. That's a different thing than, here you go with this notebook, run through it. Yes. That's, yeah, right, so yeah, I guess I, the framing. yeah, the framing of it. Okay. All right. The other part of the reason that we use this is that it's setting us up for the framework that we want to use in the workshop today, which is this seven ways. I can't think of a better way to enumerate this. Than just, this is our seven ways of talking about how to use computation as a tool for learning. And Jason's going to take from here. Okay, so I'm going to go through these seven ways. Um, these are 
seven different ways that you could use computation in working that we've thought of, and there certainly could be uh, more. So I'll take them step by step, and then we're going to go, we're going to have two sessions where you're going to think about the classes that you teach or take or want to teach, and, um, and think about how, to, how you might use these different ways in your classes, and we're going to collect a lot of this information from, we've got a lot of different disciplines out here today, so it should be pretty interesting. The first, maybe the uh, simplest one that you can think of, given a mathematical <coughs> equation, can I write some code that implements that mathematical equation? So this is just translation between some mathematical idea and then an algorithm using some programming language to um, execute that. Um, we talk about things in, math, in natural language, math notation, um, and programming languages there. So translation is the first one. The second one, proof by example, um, is to have something um, similar, similar to what you just executed that we can uh, run some code and see if it matches reality. The example here that we have is uh, Newton's Law, F equals MA. So uh, if you have your students maybe um, model a rocket with F equals MA, and they try this, and the rocket doesn't quite fly right, why might the rocket not fly right if they used F equals MA? in their computational code to see how the rocket flies. F equals MA is false. Because? Well, in general, right? <laughs> but um, a rocket, M is not constant, but uh, Newton's law does uh, typically assume that mass is constant. So you can imagine a student um, trying to use F equals MA for something that um, violates the assumptions in that equation, and they will see that uh, be wrong when they execute and simulate things in the code. All right, so that's the second one. Third one, uh, connect to the real world. So um, we are in the age of data, and there's lots of data that you can pull in about the real world and how it operates. And we can analyze that data, uh, look at it, see how, see relationships between variables, etc. So this is the, the third one. How can we bring in real data? and uh, do some computation to learn about the world. Number four is um, related to sort of what order you introduce these different concepts. If you do it top down, as we can find, um, you can provide very high level functions and libraries that hide away a lot of the details. And as we just saw in the previous notebook, on day one, you can make a set spectrum, but not know how the spectrum is made. And um, from Alan's uh, book here, a typical digital signaling processing class would start with complex arithmetic, which is needed to figure out a Fourier transform. And you might spend one or two weeks on learning complex arithmetic just so that you can calculate this Fourier transform. Um, that's boring, long, not fun, right? You don't really get engaged students at the beginning, but on day one, if I can just do a spectral analysis and think about the graph that you all just saw, um, we flipped the order of how we presented that material. And maybe the students will ask, well, how does that spectral analysis work? And then as we move into class, you can uh, go the other direction and get to the complex and arithmetic eventually. So that was four. Five. Two bytes at every apple. Um, some people love math notation, and some people don't, right, to learn things. I uh, personally um, learn math first, but when I, once I learn how to program, I prefer to um, write and explain things in a, in a program instead of with mathematical notation. And that helps me uh, understand um, the logic and the, and the, and the um, order and, the, uh, and everything else. So. One way here is that you can provide both of those, right? Both your math and the and the computation. And the students, if they if they like one, right, that's good. If they can learn from both, that's even better. So uh, we have uh, multiple tools then to provide different ways of understanding some kind of um, concept. All right. Number six is uh, symbolic computation. So the majority of computation you do um, is with uh, numerics, and maybe many of you are familiar with that, but there are also many symbolic tools like uh, Mathematica, maybe you've all used Wolfram Alpha or something like that, you can type in a 
uh, something like you would type uh, right on your piece of paper for your math, and it will manipulate those symbols for you. And the key to this is that um, when you have to do that on a piece of paper by hand, you <coughs> often get lost in the algebra, you get lost in the calculus, the details of these things. Um, I, in my class, I, uh, we take a lot of derivatives, and I don't really care um, that I don't want to see that my students know how to take their derivatives anymore. They, had, they went through their calculus class, they passed it, they made it in my class. I just want them to use those derivatives to learn about dynamics or vibrations or, or whatever I teach. And um, we don't need to take this derivative of cosine 5,000 times, right? It probably takes 30 or 100 to, to learn it. So you can um, use symbolic manipulation um, tools to um, remove some of that overhead so the students don't get lost in the details of missing signs and, and all these kind of things. And we'll show an example of that. Okay, the last one, number seven, is a bit more abstract. It's uh, the use and design of APIs. And API stands for Application Programming Interface. And, and what that means is uh, the actual thing that a student will type. Um, if you, you can have good designs of those and, and bad designs of those, okay? So if a student, um, has to just type a, um, in, in Alan's program, he has a spectrum, but if, if, he, if a student was supposed to just type S, maybe um, they would never connect the concept to that single letter, right? So maybe it's better to use a, a, a full word there in the API, or um, how many variables do the students have to type into each function? All these details about like, um, you can think about the design of what the students actually have to type and if you um, and there are good designs for learning and, um, and and bad designs for learning. And I'll let Alan explain this a little more here. And he'll talk also a lot more about this in his talk that he's going to give this afternoon. If you're also going to that. Yeah, this one. Jason and I went back and forth on how to explain this this idea, just because it's more abstract than some of the other ones that we've talked about. You know, translating from math notation to code. You've probably all done that. This is a little. Different and the talk that I'm doing this afternoon, I'm going to use a few other examples. But the thing that we just did actually helps a little bit. Once I've given the students these objects and they see the functions that these objects can perform, the methods that these objects provide, I can provide a different kind of answer. When they ask a question like, What is a signal? or What is a spectrum? a mathematical definition of those things tends to be pretty abstract. I mean, just think for a second, if someone came up and you're teaching signal processing, what's a signal? <coughs> it's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> you kind of run out of nouns pretty quickly. But if I give them a computational object, one of the things that I can do is just give them a list of, here are the operations that you can perform. If somebody gives you a signal, you can, for example, evaluate it at a particular point in time. Or you can do things like compute a wave or compute a spectrum from a signal. And that is a gradual way of answering the what is it question by explaining what it does rather than what it is. Um, so anyway, we're going to come back to this in more detail later. But that is the seven. That's the seven. OK, so now it's time for you all to think about these seven um, in terms of what you do in, in, the, uh, in the domains that you work in. So if you, you could imagine that um, we have these seven things, and then we have all the classes in the world that are taught, including the ones that you all teach and think about. And we could create a huge matrix full of um, examples of how we would use one of these seven um, for each of those instances in, in each of those classes. So you have a piece of paper. The first four are what we're going to work with uh, just after the break. So we're going to break here, and, um, but we're going to give you the preemptive uh, idea of what you're going to what you're going to do. But the first four, translation, proof by example, connect to the real world, and top-down sequence. What are we doing the first three? First uh, three or four. However, if you're excited before, if not uh, three. But we're going to start with those. And um, it's going to be your job to work in a group, uh, discuss, and create an example that you would pull from your class. Write it down. Um, you know, what math equation might be a good one to translate the code, for example. And then um, we're going to discuss <coughs> this after the break. We'll give you some time. We'll, we'll break for 10 minutes, um, have some time to work on this. We'll come around and help you. 
and then um, and then we'll have a discussion about what, these examples that people have come up with. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna collect all these from you too and try to compile a big example a big example uh, page hopefully of uh, of these ideas. Okay, um, is that all I need to say there? I think so. Yeah, if you have questions, if you're not clear on what we're asking you to do, we'll come around. Yeah. So let's take 10 minutes. It's 9. Come back at 10 after. And um, if you got that in your mind, we'll spend uh, 10, 15 minutes, I think, on that, right? And, um, and then we'll come back and discuss those, those first three or four. Your activity, remember, is you can take the first, I misspoke a little, the first three workshops, uh, three worksheets. Let's take the next 10 minutes. And you should review those and try to make an example for those first three. Okay? So think about your classes, the kind of things that you do, read the descriptions and see if you can come up with examples in those three. Um, that's translation, proof by example, connect to the real world. Uh, and if you want to, if you're fast, you can move, move on to the fourth one too. Any questions on, on that? And then we'll discuss after what some of the things people have come up with, and then move in to the beginning of uh, and then move on. Okay, can you raise attention? All right, we're going to start up here, and uh, Kenny's going to share one from their table. Okay, so we uh, I got an idea from uh, mechanical vibrations class that I helped TA last quarter. Um, so one of our activities is to uh, approximate uh, an arbitrary um, periodic function using a Fourier series. Uh, so we have to translate a mathematical formula that is a, a summation over um, some sines and cosines, and they can use this to um, compute an approximation. And so um, they're, they're having to translate a mathematical summation to something like a for loop or a vectorized summation. And um, then once, once they do this, the purpose of it for this class is to use it for uh, inputting any kind of arbitrary periodic function to a linear mechanical system. And then they can see the output. <coughs> Translating the mathematical form of a Fourier series to um, whatever that looks like in the, in the code, in the, in the software code, which might be a for loop or a, a vectorized sum. Cool. And that was the translation. How about from this table? You got one? We're all winners. Which, which? <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to flip a coin. Tell us what, okay. Um, that one. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Proof by example. Proof by example. Um, I don't teach mathematical concepts, um, so I picked back to my physics days. Um, things traveling down the ramp. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can write out the equation for how much time something should take to go down a ramp without friction, assume the frictionless surface, then run things down a ramp, see that it's slower, discuss why it might be slower, and then talk about the equation that includes friction. Great, yeah. So uh, yeah, many times we model the world without friction and uh, do not get the right results. So that would be a great example for proof by example. How about the back table? Uh, well, uh, this is my head saying example. Oh, same example. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come up with multiple ones? You got, you got one, maybe? I'll get one. Okay. Connected to the real world, or which one? Or uh, pick whichever one you want. Okay, so connected to the real world, I was, I was talking about refrigeration and refrigeration of proofs. And I started, you know, with the translation is the uh, uh, rate of heat transfer and how that, you know, in, in, in a proof, but. When you connect to the real world, you can offer examples of, you know, just go to your refrigerator and see, you know, look at the difference between a fruit that's been in a package and other that hasn't, for example. You know, so it's connecting to that uh, real world component and, and, you know, getting that inquisitive mind with things that you even have at home. And so would this uh, involve you know, collecting, maybe collecting data from a fruit in a refrigerator or, or, or a leaf of servings? You temperature. Know, like, there's any difference or collecting temperature oh, yeah. or whatever. Ta or, or the experience of the person eating the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. But so I, one of the examples we talked about is I'm a psychologist and I'm interested in uh, perception, so and in hearing. And so I'm often teaching or, you know, around students that don't have a lot of programming background or a lot of the mathematical background, but uh, 
So one of the things they'll read about in the book is that you know, a lot of hearing is based on frequency. You'll show them a couple of, uh, they'll read about sine waves, but it's not clear how that translates into what they actually hear. And so I think these kind of demonstrations where you can take, um, be able to basically say, here's, here's the equation for two different sine waves. When we sum them together, we get, uh, sometimes we get the perception of two different tones. Sometimes we get the perception of a single tone. Um, and you can demonstrate other sort of concepts that you can change the phases and you see that the time domain looks quite different, but the ear often doesn't actually distinguish between those things. They can be exactly the same. I think it's sort of a few of these these ideas of translation and input by example. Good, great. Yeah, and also connect to the real world. If, if the students right. are listening to it like we just did in the notebook, then um, uh, they're collecting data themselves in some sense. It's a lot more concrete and interactive than just reading about these things and trying to, for them to try to imagine what it actually means with these needed tools to actually uh, experience it and, and manipulate them, change the numbers and see how uh, the actual resulting sounds change. Okay. How about one for this table? Take one more. I'll we'll have one. Andrew? Go for it. All right. Um, so I'm a psych professor. I, one of the classes that I teach is for graduate students trying to expand uh, their view of what programming can do. And so the example here is to um, tell a story with data from uh, a text on the internet. And I walk you through an example of how to download an internet web page. Um, and the goal for them is to tell a story with you know, at least one plot and you know, some prediction and some outcome. Um, but the goal of it is for them to, is to force them to sit down, learn how to pull data off of a web page, and then to try to dig into regular expressions. Um, and the hope is that in the end, they can tell a little story, which is like, you know, it's like how many times do they actually say the word hot tub in hot tub time machine movie. <laughs> um, and, but it can like expand their idea of what data is. Great, very good, and it can really work. Okay, so those were the first three, and then, this is that was the beginning of session two here. I think we had a lot of good examples. I think that you all are getting in, getting into the uh, groove here and understanding. The yeah, I'm going to show you another example similar to the uh, the company one. Alan's going to talk about the ModSim framework that he's uh, recently created, and then we're going to go through and do the last three, three and four, depending on uh, what you want to do there. And uh, can you, he's new. You want to give him a packet? And if you, if you, uh, the two folks sitting by themselves, we recommend you sit in a group so that you can talk with people. Um, maybe you could join the back and, and you could join up here. Okay, so the next example comes from uh, my uh, upper level mechanical vibrations class. And the students learn how to form F equals MA, Newton's law of motion, using something called Lagrange's method or Lagrangian mechanics. And so, if you go to the bicycle.ucdavis.edu, you'll see a, a, a notebook there that is listed as 09. You can never figure out how to get out of Google presentation. There we go. So if you come back here, there's a 09 modeling a washing machine. So this is a notebook that I, um, I do some board work explaining uh, some of the math, but this one is related to symbolic computation. So I like to use in my class uh, symbolic manipulation so that they can do the math without, without having to worry too much about all the errors, sign errors, linear algebra errors, <coughs> calculus, differentiation errors, etc. So read through this. Take five minutes to do that. And there's also a binder link here if you do not have access to the bicycle server. And Kenny and Ben can come help you get to that. And then we will report out again and um, you're going to think about these questions, the same ones that we had before. All right, so take five minutes, open up that notebook. The same thing that I did before, you can uh, control. Uh, I forgot to clear it. I think I forgot to clear it. But again, one, one uh, thing that you should do, there's a cell, all output, or maybe it is clear. It looks clear. Clear, and that'll make sure that it's not none of the output is executed. And then you can shift enter on each of these 
cells with this blue in on it, and you'll see some of the results. And you can read the text, etc. In a um, mechanical engineering vibrations class, these are the questions that we had had you think about. What did we learn? What can we do? What class might this example work in? Where in the semester? What might it achieve? So let's take a few minutes, and if anybody has any thoughts on this particular notebook, which is a, an example of the symbolic use of symbolics to help 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 teach. Um, any thoughts there? Okay, and then you, you do, yes, yes. Shared a few ideas. Can I get? I would like to hear from one from one person, and we'll move on. Um, anybody want to share a particular thought about that? About this symbolic way. Oh, yes? No, I'm not a volunteer, I was just basically. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to talk to me? Uh, no, I'm, I'm All right, Mike. I'll volunteer something. So, so I thought this was curious because I normally think about getting the, getting the math across and then expecting the barrier to be the student being able to put that into computation. And here this does it kind of backwards. It writes everything down in computational language, and then the result is the mathematical expression. Yeah. Right, and that inversion is something that is totally contrary to like how my brain works and how I think about teaching. So for me, it was a bit of a struggle in a way. I mean, like you know, I can go through it and see that it's there. It's very it's well put together, and I know the equations, right? As yeah. opposed to a lot of people at my table who I think were, you know, so that inversion. I think that we all thought that was kind of interesting. I put it on our table. Very good. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you. Uh, have to think about these in terms of whatever programming language, and there's a number of symbolic programming languages that can do the same kind of thing, um, and you express it very uh, some, somewhat differently than the math sometimes, right? yeah. uh, but you get the mathematical results, so it's backwards. Great observation. All right, I'm going to hand it off to Alan, and we're going to move on here. So we've been kind of circling around this idea of mathematical modeling, and I wanted to put it on the table this is a diagram we use in a bunch of our classes, starting from the first semester, where students have come from a curriculum, they've often done high school physics, but not really thought about this process, thinking about this as starting with some system in the real world that we're trying to understand, and making a model of it, which is abstraction. Abstraction means to take things away. What you're taking away are details, like the friction on the plane, that we were talking about earlier, in order to get a model that lends itself to either analysis or simulation, or some way of executing that model to make a prediction about how the world will behave, or an explanation of why it behaves the way it does, or to help you design something, like maybe you're doing some kind of optimization. And then taking those predictions and comparing them to data from the real world, so all kinds of validation that you can do on models, and maybe those measurements are something that you did yourself, so that might be part of the process, or data that you're, you know, found data. Every step of that process is an important part of mathematical modeling, and it's almost always an iterative process. Some of the examples that we've talked about so far are the ones where you start with a very simple model, take it as far as it goes, get to the point where, well, no, actually we're not getting good predictions anymore, and we need to refine the model, and go back and rethink our modeling decisions. So this framework is hugely important in practically every field, in science and engineering. You're doing some version of this almost all the time. And one of the nice things about symbolic computation and numerical computation is that they let you work on that arrow in a lot of different ways. As contrasted with, if you are stuck with paper and pencil, you are limited to the world of models that lend themselves to analysis with paper and pencil, meaning that they have to be very simple models. You've left out a lot of detail in the world, and basically not a lot of moving parts. Because once you get from the washing machine with its one degree of freedom, once you get up to about two degrees of freedom, you pretty much can't do it on paper and pencil anymore. And what you end up with is a curriculum that tends to look like this. That you focus <laughs> so much on this arrow that students never see the rest of it. 
that very often they're given a model and say, you know, here's the model, do the analysis on it. They never had to go through this process of thinking about what do I need to include, what can I leave out, and it will still be okay. They often don't make measurements and they're not really thinking about validation because you, as the font of all knowledge, have provided the model without their doing it. So this is, I think, a hazard of a lot of current curriculum. I think the power of some of these computational tools is that they change what that arrow looks like and makes it now possible to put a lot more time and thought into those other arrows. So that slide just says what I just said, that once, once you bring in computation, you have a lot more space for these other ideas. Okay, so we wanted to use that, uh, you know, particularly the example with symbolic computation. I think it's potentially powerful. As Jason said, numerical computation is out there. Lots of curriculum includes work with numerical. Symbolic is still, I think, a relatively unused resource. I think has a lot of potential to really change what the, what the curriculum looks like. If you take the time that students spend doing symbolics on paper and think about what they could do differently with that time, that's one part of it. You can save time and they can spend time on other things. But the other is what's the set of systems in the world and what's the set of models that they could work with if they weren't limited only to things that they can do on paper. So I think it opens up space of time and also space of things that you can study. With that introduction, I want to move on to the second uh, set of three. So we did, and let me see if I remember now, we have done Connect to the Real World, Translation, and Proof by Example. The others are top-down sequencing, two bytes in every apple, symbolic computation, which we were just talking about, and this idea of using and designing APIs. These might be a little more out there than the first batch. In the first batch, we kind of heard a lot of things that you are already doing. The second batch, there might not be as much that you're already doing, but there, I hope, will be things that we're getting you to think about. So if you want to put something here that's a little more speculative, that's totally fine. We would love to hear some crazy ideas. You know, take it to, take it to an extreme. What if you completely replace? What if they did nothing on paper and it was all symbolics? Or, you know, I don't know. Take it in whatever crazy direction you want. We will take 10 minutes. Let's take 10 minutes to work on this. Then we'll take our break. And, and then we'll come back and report out. Definitely. All right, let us reconvene. Uh, let me start at the front table, if I can. Front, front table, have you guys picked uh, something that you want to report out of? Like yes. 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 What'd you call it? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> My wife makes compost. And she loves to go out to the compost pile and measure the temperature every day. And she makes it, and the cool thing is how fast it gets to 140 or 50 or 60 degrees, and how fast it comes down and how that uh, rise and decay depends on the mixture in the compost. So I was thinking that is an example of uh, the top-down sequence, is that the name for it? Yes. Where uh, we, we teach a dynamic systems course in mechanical engineering, uh, and the students need to understand what state variables are and what differential equations are and how things evolve, and uh, so I guess this would be an example. That's very cool. I like that. And also maybe under uh, connect to the real world as well. Yes. Data. Great. Thank you. How about over here? Sure. Um, we were talking about more teaching computational skills and getting students to like, and running with them and thinking about the utility of using packages like Plyr and ggplot to allow students to do something really quickly. So they can make a pretty plot that's you know, something they could be displaying. Um, and they can do that very, very rapidly with giving some just very basic code to start out with. And so that's nice because it's empowering. You can kind of see where you're going, why you're learning all this stuff that you're learning, why the coding is important to underline it. Uh, but the issues are that you know, they don't really have the building blocks to troubleshoot. So if it doesn't display exactly the way they want, or if they want to tweak something or change it, they don't really know how to do that yet. Um, and then if they really want to go beyond and do something totally new, 
they'll have to start over completely and go back to base and, and, and learn it that way. So in a way, the, the package is masking all this underlying um, knowledge that they need to have. But it, I think it can be really empowering and give a lot of motivation on that journey. Um, as far as thinking about when to teach this in a class, it seems like it's earlier on, maybe not in the very beginning, because you still need to have some basics. Um, to start with, but, but it's a nice, like, look what you can do, let's play around with it. But then you got to cut them off and before they get out those roadblocks and those troubleshooting areas, and then, then start building back up to it. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, how about the middle table? Um, well, what I talked about a little bit was um, when teaching population modeling to, like, ecology students, um, I think a lot of students are capable of really grasping like plots of populations over time, they get how it looks, you can tell what a carrying capacity is, like you can get them to think about these things. Um, but the math, the equations that generate those outputs may be a little more abstract. Um, but by putting the code and really giving them like, hey, here's this variable, which you understand, like carrying capacity or the intrinsic growth rate, you can change that and see how the resulting output changes. Now Pairing like two different outputs, like you could do the plots over time, or do predator prey model where you have you know two different populations moving in sync, and you do a phase plane diagram. Those can be hard for students to interpret. But when you pair an output where it's two populations over time with the phase plane, they can take one that they kind of know already, and then they can go, oh okay, I see. When I tweak this, I understand how it looks on this output. Oh, it starts to fall into place how this output changes. That iterative process of going back and forth between tweaking, reading, tweaking, reading, kind of gives them that two bites of every apple. They, I think, start to piece it together in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. Thank you. Good stuff. All right, I'm a back corner there. Uh, just going to have an example. I, I'm teaching undergraduate control class, and then kind of the problem. So one of that's the top down three I'm thinking about is like, for example, where I'm kind of showing the teaching the boogie plot. I think that maybe the first thing I can do is I can just ask the students to run the body command in Mala to just kind of produce the plot first. And then I'm going to explain what this plot means. So actually like the frequency response and the magnitude and space at different frequencies. So they actually understand like what does it mean and why it's useful because it's another way of presenting actually the, the, the property of the system. And they, they, can, they can also play around with it. So like just they can put in like first order system, second order system, whatever system there just by changing the, the model and then they can use the same command produce the, the result. So in this way they understand okay what is actually stand for. And then like we can teach them how we can actually kind of uh, produce this result by using mathematics. So I think that's that might be a good way of doing it. Yeah con controls is next on my hit list. <laughs> uh, that, might, that might be the next book. And I think I, partly because it's really right for top down sequencing. And the other is, it's one of those examples where you can do a lot of wandering around in a design space by trial and error, and that will only get you so far. And then yeah. the analytic techniques blow the doors off the problem. And so it can be a really nice transition from a simulation-based approach to really showing how the mathematical analysis is not just gratuitous mathematics, it really solves the problem. Yeah, that's very yeah. And this table here. Um, I thought I'd take a stab at the API idea, although I don't really know what that is. <laughs> but um, sort of the, the question is to address an abstract entity. I mean, in, in pretty much anything you do with physics, there's some stated system, which is at the end of the day, some abstract entity. And what is it defined by? It's defined by what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to know. What sort of outputs do you get from the state of the system, or is it classroom mechanics or, or anything? As a trend. As something to figure out. I like that. There's actually there's a nice correspondence there with data encapsulation, which is an idea from software engineering that says if I have an object, it contains state. But you should never, as, a, as an ideal of software engineering, you should not be making direct access to that state. You should only use the API. You should only use the methods that are provided to you. And there's actually a really nice model of particle there that says, it's got state, but you're just not allowed to ask 
what the state is. What you're allowed to do is make a measurement. Right. And it'll simultaneously give you a measurement and also change the state. <coughs> and so you get Heisenberg uncertainty sort of encapsulated as an, as an object in sure. the next way. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, I think this is, fits that API model really well. Excellent. All right, thank you. We have kept you from food and beverages for several hours now. There's a coffee and Session three, we're going to do one more example, which is Bayesian statistics. And we're going to do one or two things. One of them is day one of uh, the class at Olin that I teach on Bayesian statistics. And I've also got a, an online class that just got published within the last week or so that kind of got my attention as an interesting opportunity for discussion of the two things. And we're going to see how the timing goes, because I'm about to attempt a slightly crazy thing, which is I'm going to teach you Bayesian statistics in 20 minutes. Jason's going to start the clock now, and we're going to see how this goes. So I'm going to start out assuming that you know almost nothing about probability. So <coughs> pretend that you're a college student, and you only have the intuitive idea of probability that says that this notation P of A means that some event in the world either happens or it doesn't, and you have a probability associated with that. This notation means that you've got two things that may or may not happen, and you want to know whether both of them will happen. So this is uh, probability of A and B. And then that one might be unfamiliar. That vertical bar there means given. And that says this is the probability that A occurs given that I've been informed that B is true. B happened, and now I want to know conditionally whether A is also going to happen. So I'm going to make an outrageous claim here, which is that if I compute the probability of A and B, that I can figure that out by asking first whether or not A happened, and then, given that A happened, what's the chance that B also happened? And I'm going to claim that I could flip that around that it's the same thing to ask whether B and A happen. And I can figure that out by asking about B first. Did B happen? And if it did, the probability that B happened given A. So my assertion without proof is that those two things are equal to each other. And if they are, then I can write this equation. And if I divide through by the probability <coughs> of B, what I get is, Base theorem. So I haven't exactly proved it, but I've at least shown you the outline of how you would prove it. And the reason I did that is to say that this is just a law of mathematics. It follows from the definition of probability in a pretty straightforward way. So this, so far, is uncontroversial. So I'm going to take this as just a truth. By the way, this is a neon sign in a, in a cafe in London, and if you're curious about what to get me for my birthday, I would really like to have a neon sign with Bayes there on it. What's the name of the restaurant? I don't remember. <laughs> that page is from Wikipedia, so if you look it up, or the picture is from Wikipedia. So there are two ways to think about what Bayes theorem is, and they're both useful. The first one is, for some reason, if you know this conditional probability, and what you really want is that one, then Bayes theorem gives you a way to go back and forth between those two things. And often it's the case that the three things on the right-hand side, you can think of this as there are three quantities over there. If, for some reason, it's easier to figure out these three than it is to figure out the left-hand side directly, this gives you a divide-and-conquer strategy that just says if you can knock off three small problems, you can assemble them and solve the first problem. So that's one way to think about Bayes' theorem. Is it's like a divide and conquer strategy for computing conditional probabilities. In the context of Bayesian statistics, this is the interpretation we're almost always interested in, which is the diachronic interpretation. Diachronic is Greek for through time. And it's the idea that you have a set of beliefs before you see some data. And what the data let you do is update the belief. You change what you believe based on data. So you're given the probability of a hypothesis before you see the data. And what you're trying to find is the probability of the hypothesis conditioned on the data. 
or given that you have seen the data. So this is the example, this is the canonical first example that you always see for applying Bayes theorem, which is two bowls or two urns full of marbles, although to make it slightly more appealing, they are bowls full of cookies <coughs> with different proportions. So one of the bowls has 10 chocolate and 30 vanilla cookies. The other bowl is 50-50. And you take some data, which is to say that you choose one of the two bowls at random, and let's assume that that means 50-50. And then you choose a cookie at random, and let's assume that that means proportionally to the cookies in the bowl. Turns out to be a vanilla cookie. And the question you want to ask is, what's the probability that the bowl that you chose from is bowl number one? Okay? So this is a natural kind of question to which Bayes' theorem lends itself very nicely. So here's the framework. We're going to define the hypothesis, which is that the cookie came from bowl one. We're going to take as the data that we got a vanilla cookie. And we're going to figure out how to get from P of H to P of H given D. And in our vocabulary, that's going from the prior, what did you believe prior to the data, to the posterior, which is that, what did you believe after you saw the data. These other terms also have names. This is the conditional likelihood of the data, given that your hypothesis is true. And this is the total probability of the data under any hypothesis at all. So if we can figure out these three pieces, then we can figure out the posterior probability. And we can start filling them in. So before I saw the cookie, before I knew whether it was vanilla or chocolate, there was a 50-50 chance that I chose the first bowl. That was just given to me in the statement of the problem. I assumed that I chose one of the bowls at random, so the prior was 50-50, or one half. <coughs> the conditional likelihood of the data means, given that the hypothesis is true, in other words, given that it's bowl number one, what would be the probability of the data, what would be the probability of a vanilla cookie? If you go back to the statement of the problem, the bowl number one is three quarters vanilla cookies. So that's where the conditional likelihood of the data comes from. And then the last part, the denominator of Bayes' theorem, is sometimes kind of a pain to compute, because it's the probability of the vanilla cookie under either of the two hypotheses. In general, you have to do a little bit of work to compute it. For this special case, I can compute it directly which is I had an equal chance of choosing any of the cookies from either of the two bowls. So I can imagine if I just take all the cookies and dump them out into one big mixture, five-eighths of them are vanilla. So in this particular case, computing the denominator is kind of easy. We're going to come back in a minute and I'll show you the general way of solving it. But now, given that I have figured out all the things on the right-hand side, Computing the posterior is now just arithmetic. You can turn off your brain, and it turns out to be three-fifths. Okay, so given that you drew one vanilla cookie, you now think that there is a 60% chance that that cookie came from bowl number one. Which hopefully makes some sense. Bowl number one contains more vanilla cookies than bowl number two. <laughs> so the data you got were more likely under bowl number one <coughs> than under bowl number two. So having seen it, you should be a little bit more confident that it was bowl number one. Each vanilla cookie, every time you draw a vanilla cookie, you should be thinking, hmm, that's a little bit more likely to be bowl number one. And every time you get a chocolate cookie, you can think of your probability needle, sort of the, the famous New York Times wobbly needle. You started out at 50-50. You saw a vanilla cookie, and that shifted you to about 60%. So intuitively, it makes sense that the vanilla cookies move you to your right and the chocolate cookies to your left. Bayes' theorem tells you exactly how much you should change your beliefs, given the data. All right. So we did that explicitly using Bayes' theorem. The next step, I want to do the same computation, but using a table method for applying Bayes' theorem. And if you click on that link, so again, you'll need my slides. If you don't already have my slides up, you can grab it from tinyurl.com, comp stem. 
And then if you click on this link, it will give you the option to create a new copy of that spreadsheet. And I'll do that up here and you can follow along. So this spreadsheet will walk you through the algorithm for applying Bayes' theorem to problems like this. You've got a column for the hypotheses. There's no math there. Those are just labels that you're going to put onto the row so that you can keep track of what's what. So if you call this bowl one and this bowl two, and then for this problem, we only have two hypotheses. <coughs> And we're going to give them priors. So before we saw the data, this is equals one half, equals two. And since we only have two hypotheses, I'm just going to zero out the other two. So you can start with the priors. Now we need to figure out the two likelihoods, which is what is the likelihood of the data under each hypothesis. So if, magically, we knew for sure that it was bowl number one, the probability of getting a vanilla cookie would be three quarters. Because again, we were given, in the statement of the problem, we were given that the bowl number one has three quarters vanilla cookies. And does anyone remember from 10 slides ago how many vanilla cookies there are in bowl number two? 50-50. And again, I'm just going to zero out the rows for the hypotheses that we're not using. Okay. At this point, you might notice that the spreadsheet has already done the rest of the computation for you. Because <laughs> notice you've specified the priors and the likelihoods, everything else is just arithmetic, the spreadsheet has done it for you. One note, there are a couple of things that people are sometimes disturbed by in this. One of them is the priors add up to one because they are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. In other words, exactly one of them must be true so their probabilities add up to one. That part's fine. These likelihoods, you will notice, do not add up to one. There's no reason they should add up to one. It's OK that they don't add up to one. They are, each of them is individually just the probability of the data given a hypothesis. There's just no reason they necessarily add up to anything. Now, what does the actual computation look like? What the spreadsheet is doing is it's taking each prior and multiplying it by the likelihood. So this is just the product of those two, and same thing here. So now I've got two, what are called the unnormalized posterior probabilities. If I add them up, that's what this column is doing, I get the total probability of the data. That's the denominator of Bayes' theorem. And then it is going to take this whole column and divide through by the total so that these posteriors are now normalized. And normalized means that they do add up to one. <coughs> because just as the priors were mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, so are the posteriors. And there's the same 60% that we just got when we did it by hand. Okay. So this is a little bit of a sideways view of what we saw the first time around. We saw it in a mathematical formula. We applied the formula. And now we're seeing it in the form of a spreadsheet that is filling in the parts that we understand from the statement of the problem, and then the arithmetic is being done automatically for us. So let me pause there for a second. Any questions about those two ways of applying Bayes' theorem? Good so far? Thank you. Makes sense? I'll get a drink. Yeah? How is this different from in in implementing the equations in the spreadsheet? That's what it looks like to me. Good question. Is this different from just implementing the equations in a spreadsheet? 
Not by much. That's basically what it is. Maybe from the point of view of a student seeing this, it's this puts the data up front and hides the equations. And the, equa the mathematical form tends to start with the equations and then you plug in the data. Which is absolutely not different in a conceptual way, but maybe it's a little bit of that two bites of the apple. You know, if you see the same thing twice, you get another chance to make it make sense. <coughs> okay. I'm going to go back to the slides. <coughs> Okay. If there are things there that didn't make sense, this slide might help just a little bit. This is walking through the steps that we just did. And then this is filling in the computation. This one uses fractions rather than decimals, but it's the same idea. All right. Now, I'm going to put it to you to solve the next problem. This is called the dice problem. So imagine that I have a box of dice that contains four different dice. One of them is four-sided, six-sided, eight and 12 sided. If you've played Dungeons and Dragons, you know what these dice look like. I, I really do have a box of these dice. Here. So let's say, let's say that I don't let you see the box. I draw one of the dice at random, and let's assume again that that means equal probability of choosing each die. I roll the die, and I report to you, honestly, that I rolled a six. But you don't know which die it was. You would like to compute what is the probability that I rolled each of those dice. Okay. You're going to do this basically, take the spreadsheet that I just gave you, and walk through that process here. Think about what are the hypotheses, what are the priors, and what is the likelihood of the data under each hypothesis. If you can answer those three questions, you're done, and the spreadsheet will magically answer the question. So oh. I were four-sided? Uh, four, six, eight, and 12. Nice. They count by one, starting from one? And each of them is labeled from one to the number of sides that it has. Details. <laughs> <laughs> so when I do workshops, one of the things that I do a lot if people are working is I'll say, if you're making good progress on this and you don't need my help, ignore me right now. If you're stuck, then let me at least help you get started, which is I'm going to fill in the two columns. I've got four hypotheses about which die it was. And again, these are just labels, so you can put whatever text you want into that box. The prior probabilities are 0.25 for each one, a quarter for each one, because that was the statement of the problem. The only part where you actually have to do some thinking is the likelihoods. So let's maybe start with the first one. If it really is a four-sided die, if magically you know for sure that that hypothesis is true, what would be the probability of getting a six on a four-sided die? Yes. Zero. Nine. Zero. Negative one. <laughs> no, zero. It has, it has no chance of happening. So in fact, the right likelihood to put there is zero. And you'll notice mathematically, because I'm multiplying, this is always a product, Anytime this is zero, the result will also be zero. So anytime the data contradict your hypothesis, the probability of that hypothesis immediately goes to zero. And all of that probability mass gets redistributed to the other hypotheses. All right, let's fill in the others. If it really is <coughs> a six-sided die, in other words, again, if you imagine math, magically know that that's the right answer. What's the chance of getting a six on a six-sided die? One out of the six sided. One sixth. And this, the nice thing about this divide and conquer strategy is that it gets reduced to questions that are sort of embarrassingly easy. And similarly, if it's an eight-sided die, the chance of getting a one, getting a six, or any other number between one and eight, is one eighth, and this is one over twelve. And now you can turn off your brain. Because the spirit of the good Reverend Thomas Bayes comes and finishes off the problem for you. You did the work, Thomas Bayes does the arithmetic, and it turns out that the prior, the, sorry, the posterior probabilities are 0 0.44, 0 0.3, and 2.2, which you might recognize as 4 ninths, 3 ninths, and 2 ninths. 
and the four-sided die has been eliminated. Questions? We started with the cookie problem, we did the dice problem, yes. Why doesn't my spreadsheet, when I put those numbers in, have the same numbers as yours does? Good question. Let me, I'm going to yeah. ask yeah. Jason. Oh, yeah, if you just type fractions, dates. it thinks they're dates. Yeah, you have to do equals. Thank you. <laughs> Good one. So, congratulations, you have solved the dice problem. Now, these are kind of like toy problems, but the reason I'm using them is that we have now come to a real world problem that is legit. This is actually from World War II. German tanks, when they were captured, had serial numbers on them that had been allocated in kind of a funny way, which is that each factory during each month was given a block of 100 serial numbers. But they weren't all used in any given month. But they started from one and worked their way up. So the serial numbers that you saw gave you a hint about how many tanks the Germans were producing. So if you imagine that you capture a tank and you know which block the serial numbers came from, and you capture tank number 37, you get some information there about how many tanks there are, or how many parts. There are actually wheels and chassis that they were looking at. So what do you know? It's a block of 100 numbers. You capture tank number 37. What does that tell you? Yeah. There are at least 37 tanks. They've got at least 37 tanks. So everything from 36 on down has been eliminated by the data. What is the most likely number of tanks that the Germans have? <coughs> Seven, 30. 37 turns out to be the answer. Mm -hmm. Because in some sense, you have rolled a 37-sided die, mm -hmm. and you got the number 37. For anything less than number 37, the likelihood is 0. For anything 37 and up, the likelihood is 1 over n which you might recognize as exactly the same likelihoods we just computed for the dice problem. In fact, the German tank problem and the dice problem are the same problem. And you could solve them with a spreadsheet that looks like this. The only difference is that it has 100 rows in it. I'm only showing you four of them, but for everything from 36 on, <coughs> the likelihood is zero. And for everything from 37 on up, the likelihood is one over n. Everything else about this problem is exactly the same. And what you end up with, and I forget whether I put this in the slides. I didn't. You end up with a curve that has the numbers from 1 to 100. Everything from 37 on down is now 0. And the posteriors look like that. It's a 1 over n curve that's been truncated and then normalized so that the area under that curve is 1. And the most likely value is actually 37. So you have now not only solved the German tank problem, you have solved the German tank problem better than the Allies did during World War II. That this was actually going on, conventional intelligence estimates at the time were off by about an order of magnitude. And the statistical analysis based on the method that I just showed you was pretty good. You might not be able to read that. The estimate was 169. The actual value was 122. During another month, the estimate was 244. The actual value was 271. So it was a remarkably effective statistical method. You've now gone from a hypothetical starting place of knowing nothing other than a basic definition of probability to solving a real world problem using Bayesian statistics. In uh, 20 minutes? In, uh, uh, yeah, 20 minutes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 22. So while I was preparing this, I had sort of an interesting contrast that came up because I was thinking about, and this is, uh, this is from Big Bayes. 
This is basically, I think, chapter two of Think Gays. And then I got this, I saw this uh, tweet about our graduate level course invasion statistics that looked promising. So it says, you know, full, full graduate course, video, slides, and homework online. And just, I wanted to check it out. And I would like you all to check it out and just think about it from the point of view of curriculum design and some of the things that we've been talking about today. If you follow the link in the notes, you can get to the syllabus. Take a look at that. And then the other, the first lecture is also in the slides. And if you get a chance, I think rather than play it up here, I'll just have people play it, play it whenever you want. But in particular, if you start at 1136, the instructor there is stating the value proposition for the class, which I think is a really good place for us to start in thinking about curriculum design. And actually, I appreciate the fact that he does exactly that. Because sometimes we kind of forget. It's like, well, you know, you're here because you have to be here, and we're going to get started. And no one ever says, here's why we're doing this. Here's the value proposition. Here's what you're going to get from this class. And he does that starting at 11. <coughs> so look over those materials. Watch maybe just a couple minutes of the video, and then we'll discuss a little bit. It looks like he's taking a total bottom-up approach, at least in the beginning, right? He's saying, there are examples on how you apply this and how it would work in the real world, but I'm not going to show them to you, being very upfront, but he's not going to show them right away. Yep, yep, so bottom-up, good, yeah. What else did you see? Yeah. He at least told you where you were going to get. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was nice that if you're going to do a very bottom-up approach, it's like we're gonna we're gonna go through the basics and build in your head before you get to any application. At least he described what that final end goal is, like the light at the end of the tunnel a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. He actually used the words "trust me." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, he did show the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, he had some nice visualizations for like kind of sets for how you could visualize what Bayesian means, mm -hmm. like just that equation, and several of those types of uh, visualizations of the mathematical concept mm -hmm. um, were critical for me understanding uh, probability and statistics. Yeah. Like I took a course in undergrad, I didn't understand it at all, at all until I took a class, a graduate level class, and they actually just went through the basics slower and with more visual visualization options, yeah. and then Going from that understanding to like plugging in the math on the spreadsheet is not a big deal, but right. understanding the picture was much more critical for me. Right, right. And that might be another example of two bytes in every app folder. Sure. But maybe if you add visualization, maybe that's three bytes. Yeah. Right. Yes. I guess my view is that he was giving sort of the negative self in the beginning. I actually listened to the first part of it, and his his, his lecture starts off with this is going to be really hard and you shouldn't be in my classroom unless you want to work five to ten hours <laughs> every hour that I lecture. So um, if that's not why you want to be here, go away. So it was, it was sort of the opposite of being a salesman. It was basically being a negative salesman, which mm -hmm. is that and not I'm going to try to entice you to do any of this. It's like, this is really hard and if you don't want to do it, go away. But that was kind of an interesting way to approach your class. I had the opposite reaction to that. Sure. I appreciated the instructor saying this is hard because I, I always get frustrated with people and go or go and lecture and like, oh, this is you'll get it, you know, this is easy or you could figure this out, we'll get there, you know. But having them correct say like there is a learning curve, this is going to be hard. I, I appreciate that part of it. Though. Yeah, that's funny. I was thinking of Greek tragedy. My reaction was more like Marx, uh, and less like yours. But I think I mean yours is obviously valid. I just think he's potentially losing people who might be completely transformed by this mathematical field by, you know, saying you'll never get through it or, or it's going to be really tough or whatever. Yeah, it's not everybody's motivated that right, way. Right, there's a happy medium. Yeah, but maybe. At least that's just hours and effort versus, I like, I think uh, I have been turned off, like, feel, being surrounded by people who I assume are just getting it. Right. And if I feel like I'm not just getting it, right. then it doesn't matter how hard I work, I might as well just stop now. I think there's a difference between trying to scare them off. What you're saying is valid, and but 
at the same time, it should be, it should, someone shouldn't say, this is easy or stupid if you don't get it. I, that's, a bad, that's a bad strategy, right? right? That, but, I agree. <laughs> but, but having him say, you know, it's going to be really hard and you really shouldn't be here unless you really want to be here, that's going a little too far the other way, or maybe a lot too far the other way, in terms of, like, warning you that, no, no this, you could just say, this is not an easy course, right? However, I think you will get a lot if you if you go through it, right? That's somewhere in between the two extremes. Andrew? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I think about here is that it, it this approach makes it seem like his his description of it makes it seem like a very all or nothing approach. I think that's the issue. It's presented as either you put in this much work and you come out with a complete and total and beautiful understanding of like this really long list, a really pretty beautiful like, list of topics, or you drop and there's, there's no in between. And I think there's got to be some level of like, you're going to have students who are going to dig in and get to the point where like, they could pick up a project and apply these things like that. And you're going to have students who come away with, you know, I feel like I understand this better. I feel like I could, you know, take another course on it, or I could start to dig through stuff and learn more stuff on my own time. But that modularity, I think, is important. Like giving people something they can grasp at the core of every concept as a starting block gives them that, like, gives you that motivation that, like, okay, I maybe didn't get everything, but I got something out of this. I'll, I'll stick with it to the next chapter, and so on and so on and so on. So I think there's a level of, like, building in those the layers of understanding that's important. And, and you know, short cycles of, from a student point of view, you invest, you get a payoff. You invest, mm -hmm. you get a payoff. Mm -hmm. Instead of an entire semester of investment, then maybe there's a payoff. Mm -hmm. um, good, so there are a lot of nice ideas about that first contract that he's establishing. Other thoughts about the organization of the class? I put the syllabus up there, if you had a chance to look at that. Any observations about that or other thoughts? Mike? Is that it? That is, that is the syllabus. There are actually there are two documents that he's got. There are two different. There's like an outline and a syllabus, and they're slightly different. Okay. I, what I was looking at, I thought base came up way later on down the page, but mm -hmm. that's not what I'm seeing there. So my memory was wrong. Yes. Let me see. Sorry. No, you're right because it's uh, there's, there's like a lecture sort of. Yeah. And here are the lectures. Right. right. To come up like. So lecture two is probability and stats, lecture three is information theory, lecture four is cursive dimensionality. That seems like a really, really long list. Yeah, so finally we get to Bayesian number five. There, that's the first time Bayesian occurs. It's like, whoa. Bayesian inference and likelihood function calculation. So it's, it's bottom up, as we saw before. I would also characterize this as organized around the tools rather than organized around an application. And I think about mm -hmm. this, like if, if, if you're doing machine shop, you would come in and you would make a project where you would use one saw, one screwdriver, one tool, and go through an entire process of an application. And then maybe go back and learn a new set of tools and a new application. This is organized around saws. Day one, all the saws in the world. Day two, all the hammers in the world, and so on. Not necessarily wrong. I don't want to be too prescriptive about this, but that's my observation there. It's probably clear that my bias is toward application focus and relatively short cycles of payoff. It reminded me of the students that were taking this course. You said it could be applied to lots of different disciplines, but it struck me as being very much more math stats. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, and that's an interesting. The, if the name of the class is Statistical Computing for Scientists and Engineers. And the students in the room are graduate students from lots of different departments. And he talks about that a little bit at the beginning. So it's almost a survey course in math. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. I think that would maybe be a different approach for that audience, but I'm not sure I would call this a survey course. I think you're right to call it a math stats course. Yeah. It is about the mathematical tools that you apply to vision stats. 
Maybe one last observation, then we should move on. Thought? Anyone want to have the last word? Yeah, I'm just looking at wanted to compare it to the one based in stats course I took, which was actually Richard McElroy's course, and yeah. looking back sort of at the structure that he uses, and it, it seems like there is some level of doing things from the bottom up, because you just, it, you're, it's not, there's a certain prerequisite level of knowledge that you really need, but I think building each, I think Richard did a good job of building each section as like a concept that you come away with some understanding of and some application of and why it's important in its own right, and it builds upon it rather than like, all right, we're going to teach you the definitions of all these different statistical concepts, right? Like the second lecture there, I think, was just basically walking through all these different distributions and what they mean. And do you come away with that with like, ah, I can do this thing? Maybe not. But walking away with, yeah, like you said, those short term payoffs that then plug into greater, broader payoffs down the line, I think, is really and giving examples at each step. It's hard to give examples of real world things when it's such specific, minute building blocks that you start from. Great. All right, I'll let you have the last word. Jason, you're up. <clears throat> so we've got a couple more things to do. The next, uh, we've started, we sort of looked at this class and thought about some of the good things and bad things about it. Um, here, I want to talk specifically more about the obstacles that we face on getting computing, computing into our curriculum, into our classes, into our activities. So, I want you to think about these. You know, what makes it hard to get this kind of stuff that we've been talking about today in, into the classes and uh, getting the skills to the students? Um, do we add them to existing classes, change existing classes, or create new classes? Or maybe there's some more. So let's, I want to take uh, five or so minutes to discuss with your table the kind of obstacles that you see to getting computing into the, into the classroom and into the curriculum. And then we'll come back and discuss about that. And then I'll tell you a few that Alan and I have thought about. OK, so five minutes. Think about the obstacles of getting computing into the curriculum. And we'll come back. People like to talk about obstacles. How about we share share a couple, two or three from the tables? Um, we'll start with the big tables. What do you all think the biggest obstacle is to getting and using computation? Yeah. Let me throw one thing on the table. Yeah. Uh, it has, I'll combine together the existing approach to education and the details under that would be the curriculum that we have and the faculty that we have. We could never get them to agree on how to do this, what, well, whether you should do it, how to do it, and then who's going to take the time if you actually decided that you wanted to do something to do it. So that, but there was a lot more that we talked about in the group, so other people thought. I can maybe come back to you too. Yeah, um, that makes me think of, uh, well, how did the people do it that invented the first curriculum that we're now using? They okay. must have. They must have Conquer that, agree to something. Yeah, I mean, you said, what, what makes it hard? And this is a really, really hard thing. Yeah, just getting people to agree to do it at all, and then how to do it, and then who's going to do it. Yeah. And well, Mon, Mon, who left, he's been trying to do this for 30 years in mechanical engineering. Not in our department. Literally. Yeah, <laughs> but never made any solid progress. Yeah, some, but. Yeah. The, the same point of that, too, is the continuity, because one faculty member may figure it out for their course, but then they're not teaching it the next quarter, and a different faculty member is. And so for the students themselves who go through the series, they're all emerging with different skill sets at different times and different platforms. So for faculty later on who are teaching an upper division course, now they have an impossible challenge yeah. to design their program. Yeah. yeah, I found it surprising when I joined my department that teachers talk the same classes differently. And uh, I didn't quite understand that. But, <laughs> we can talk about that. but uh, OK, how about somebody else maybe back table? Did you guys come up with any obstacles? We're both graduate students, and uh, don't know as much of the teaching That's experience, fine. I think. But yeah, um, I, I think for me, too, just in, in some of those other disciplines that aren't engineering disciplines, that some of the challenges are just going to be uh, basic uh, competency of some of the students to, to don't already have some background in, in thinking computationally. Uh, I think 
making sure that everybody gets some of that up front is, is probably an important starting point mm -hmm. for social science at least. Yeah, that was a great one. Mark and I think we should be I think the biggest obstacle is that you have such a certain amount of material to cover and you have to take a risk to try to do it a different way that's been done before that you don't know if they're going to learn faster, slower, or better, or worse. So you're going to have to decide, okay, I'm going to try this, and so you have to be a little bit of a risk taker to, to, change, to change the way it's being done, and to know the amount of time that you can still cover all the material you need to cover. Because you only got 10 weeks. 10 weeks is not very long. And so some, some things, some, I wouldn't say something has to give, but you don't know that something doesn't have to give it going in. And that's, that's not clear. That, that's an obstacle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we don't know. Risk aversion. Is yeah, it's risk aversion, especially when you're not tenured. Which <laughs> um, one more from your table? Do you have another good one? Anybody else? One thing I was thinking about a little bit was like, if you're teaching code within the context of a particular course, it may be hard for students to extrapolate that. That kind of has to do with this continuity thing as well. Like, even if, you know, like you think for ecology, a lot of people learn some R because they're gonna need like they're gonna need it at some point for dissertation. Absolutely they will need to use it. But in the interim, are they using it at all? Um, are they gonna be able to apply those skills broad more broadly? And like, do you teach people uh, to be good at using Stack Overflow? Because that's like <laughs> my far and away most used skill in, in coding is learning to identify what my problem is and then looking up how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that if you only think of in implementing these methods into a particular course and you don't think about it as a more broad thing, you're giving people tools to solve a very specific problem or set of problems within your course, but not to apply those outside that. Your last thoughts? Well, it's just, I mean, kind of building on that, right? That's the difference between, perhaps, between a course and a curriculum, mm -hmm. right? You have to look at the curriculum to form the whole person at the end, whether you're talking about an undergraduate or graduate curriculum. And the courses have to do pretty, pretty specific things. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a way to think about that challenge. Mm -hmm for us to think about that challenge. Because I think this is, from my perspective, this is a huge innovation in the curriculum. A gap that we have is that there are very few templates for trying to do this. None of us learned this way, generally, in school. Uh, and so there's a huge opportunity, but there's this difficult thing to get over. And I think people like Alan and you, Jason, are you know, giving us a lot of help in creating templates like that that we can use in our you know, various places in the curriculum. It seems like I'm very hopeful about it. It's hugely enabling using numerics for sure. Any others? Shall we? I'll uh, quickly go through some of the ones that we thought of that I think will tie in. I think they did all right. They pretty much got them. I think you pretty much got them. So, overstuff curriculum. There you go. Uh, we, we heard that, I believe. Keith, uh, Keith takes, if you want to add something, you've got to take something away. And um, we can't remove anything, right? From yeah. curriculum. A absolutely nothing. Uh, if you change A, then the, the Following courses are going to, uh, the teachers of that are going to reject, right? They don't want you to remove anything from a prerequisite. Um, but uh, student prep, we heard from psychology, right? No programming experience. Um, you know, we've got to teach them how to do this, and that's going to take time. Programming is hard, so even if you teach it well, there's still a variety of outcomes. You'll have students at different skill levels that may not be what you're expecting. Um, farming out classes, we've probably all talked about that in our departments, but um, uh, you know, a CS department may teach it like we saw the uh, stats class, right, and not give us any applications, in my, in my case engineering, which, which I really like them to see um, and, and not get lost in uh, what's the fastest sorting algorithm for, uh, for some given set of data. Chase, I'll even say that it doesn't work even, in, even within a department. If you assign a specific faculty member to do this particular task and you don't engage it in the broader curriculum, yes. it isn't going to work that way either. So farming it in maybe is a different way to say that. Good, good, good addition. Good addition. The free rider problem. Like we want our students to have skill X, right? In this case, programming. Uh, but who's going to do it? 
and uh, we want somebody else to do it and uh, not take a slice of our pie in our class, right? right? Faculty prep, we don't necessarily know how to teach this either, and um, we may need to get training, and Alan will talk a little bit about that, but um, uh, good programmers are not necessarily good at teaching um, uh, the programming skills that we want, and uh, we may have lack of skills there. Faculty incentive structure, Right, the easy path is to uh, take the notes from the previous person, teach your class, not change anything. Um, it takes work and time to make, make change. And we have to uh, have an incentive to do that. If you don't, people are not going to do it. All right, those are the ones you came up with. Question. Last comment. How, have you come up with ways to advise or, or just around So you don't necessarily have to say, I'm going to teach Python in my mechanics class. But if you say, I'm going to teach a subset of the language that is sufficient for just this set of examples, and I'm going to apply it immediately, I think you're right that there's a cognitive load there because the students are seeing multiple languages. They're seeing math and natural language and programming at the same time. So I think there's some management that has to happen. There. But I think if it's bite size, then they reinforce each other too. So there's a there's sort of a, a there can be a positive cycle as well as the negative cycle. Yeah. What do you think of things like engineering equation solving, which is not really programming, but it sort of is programming? Yes. Do you think those are like those are appropriate baby steps to get into programming? That's a great question. Let me come back to that one in just a second because that's coming up in just a minute. So let me, since Jason very kindly laid out all the problems, I'm now going to tell you how to solve all of those problems. <laughs> there is no solution to all of those problems. Uh, the best I can offer you, I have a bunch of tools or pieces that I think we can assemble into solutions. Let me lay them out and see what we think of it. This one, I think, is really important. Student-centric curriculum design means that we as the designers of the curriculum know where our students are coming from and we know where they're going. Mm -hmm. If we don't know that, we have no basis for making curriculum decisions. If we do know that, then we know how to meet them where, where they are, which I think is a really important idea. Your students are who they are at the moment that they arrive in your classroom. They know what they know, they can do what they can do. And Often, I think we fall into a trap of pretending that they're supposed to be something that they're not and delivering a class that's designed for someone else. Yeah? Uh, sorry to interrupt so quickly, but that seems like a really hard problem because my view of the students as they come in, yep. there are students who are here, yes. and there are students who are here, and yes. the gap between those students is huge. So and do you, that's do you design, design it to the middle? Do you design it to the bottom? Do you design it to the top? You design it to the whole distribution. Define, how do you define this? You design to the whole distribution. That is part of the range that you see in your classroom is part of your design target. And it's hard. But it does. there are ways to design a class that will serve a wide audience. By and large, the more you create a structure that gives them the ability to choose paths, and choose the material that they are ready for and take it in the direction that they want to take it, 
the more you can serve a wide range of people and take them from wherever they are, meaning a wide range, often the outcome will also be a wide range. The, by and large, the students who are best able to take advantage of that environment you've created will make the most progress over the course of the semester. Other students will make less progress, but they're making progress. So I can't guarantee that, that the range will get any narrower, but you can create an environment that is beneficial to everyone so that everyone is able to make as much progress as they can make during that semester. And that's how I think about meeting the students where they are. The other part of this is having a real understanding of where they're going. The tendency, I'm going to be a little mean here, tendency is for faculty to replicate themselves, to generate a curriculum that prepares the next generation of people to become professors. The vast majority of our students don't become professors. If we're in an engineering program, they're going to become engineers, or at least a large fraction of them are. If you have never worked as an engineer, you probably don't actually know what they need to know. And I think that is hugely important because that is the only way that we can get out of the problem of taking something out of the curriculum. If you and we, you and I could fight endlessly about whether a student really, really needs to know how to integrate by parts. Or we could go watch engineers for a thousand person hours and wait until you find me a working engineer integrating by parts. And when you find that, then I will believe you when, we, when you say that we absolutely need to keep teaching that. You won't. And that's one of the ways that we can actually finally take something out of the curriculum. So that is, if you only take one thing away today, that is the soapbox I want to stand on today. Student-centric design is, I think, the only way to get out of some of the obstacles that we've been talking about. It's the only way to take anything out of the curriculum. I will suggest a couple of strategies. I think there are a lot of things that you can do on a small scale. There are things that you can inject into a class starting tomorrow. When do classes start? Monday. 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 Starting Monday. There are things that you can do on Monday. Uh, like a day one strategy that has an immediate payoff. You could take a room full of students who know absolutely nothing about your topic and in the space of a one hour class, get them to the point of immediately seeing a payoff so that they leave your classroom on day one able to do something that they couldn't do 60 minutes ago. One other suggestion, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, collaborative models of if you don't have the preparation that you need to do the things that you want to do in a classroom, find the other people who can do it. If you can possibly co-teach classes, this is what I'm going to suggest in, in a minute, if you can possibly get together and teach classes together, that is one of the things that I've had a chance to do at Olin a lot, and I never would have imagined until I did it how much you learn from doing that. Mm -hmm. You and I can talk about our classes until we're blue in the face, but honestly, you just have to go through one cycle of a class as an instructor, follow it along. And all of your conversations about the curriculum will suddenly become concrete in a way, and, and you will make progress in a way that you just can't otherwise. If you can't do that, at least you can do what we call a virus model of collaboration, where you get someone to come in and just inject a module into a class. If it's a 10-week class, you could do a one or a two-week module where someone comes in and collaborates with you for just that part of it. So I do think you can start small, but the other part of this is we've talked about curriculum design end to end. It, you, you can't get away from that. That is necessary. Particularly thinking about this idea of investing in the students, developing their skills at every stage of the pipeline so that they will then apply those skills downstream. And it's hard because what they learn is learned in a context and we know from cognitive science that, it's, that people just don't do well at taking something that you learn in one context and applying it flexibly in a new context. We're just bad at it. But I think once we acknowledge that we're bad at it, we can design a curriculum that, that realizes that, that you almost have to start over 
each time in a new context. But if you do that, it does accumulate. And if you've designed a curriculum where the students build a little bit of skill in their first class and a little bit more in the second class and so on, I think that's the only way to do it. You can't say, okay, we're going to spend you know, one class in the first semester, they're going to learn all the programming they need to learn, and then we're, that's what we're going to use downstream. I just, I think that's not the solution. And that gets me to the question that you're asking about, the temptation to use the tool that might actually be the best choice for one class is not the best choice for the curriculum as a whole. That there's a little bit of a conflict between cashing in the investment versus investing in what goes downstream. And so I'm arguing for building programming skills in a general purpose programming language. Because that's what really pays off as you accumulate it. It's like the power of, of um, compounded interest. But if you spend your capital, and my analogy here is if you use a domain-specific tool, you're spending your capital. And you don't get the interest to pay off. So it's a short-term, long-term thinking. One of the things that I've learned, again, the corollary to programming is hard. Even if you teach it really well, not everybody is going to get it on the first attempt. Not everybody is going to get it on the second, third, or fourth attempt. So I think you have to have a curriculum that is safe. And what I mean by that is everybody gets an opportunity to learn this material, but they also get it in a context where if they don't get it the first time around, they can still do well in your class, even if the programming piece didn't click for them. And that's one of the places where a dedicated programming class can be a problem, because the outcome tends to be bimodal. People kind of either get it or they don't. And if it's all or nothing, it, that's too painful for them. You know, it, emotionally, but also in terms of things like GPA, in terms of things like failing out of a program or switching out of your program. Mm -hmm. But if you can make it safe, say, look, here you're going to have many opportunities to learn this. If you get it, great. If you have a hard time, we're going to give you all the resources you need. We're going to help you as much as we can. But we're also going to say you can do well in my class even if you're having a hard time mm -hmm. with the program. So none, none of, like many attempts, none of them fail. The other one, and I think I actually heard this, I forget who said this, if you want the students to program, you have to teach them to program. There's a little bit of a mythology that, oh, you know, they'll figure it out. I'll give them the book and they'll learn to teach themselves to program. Yeah, that works for some students, but it really, really doesn't work for a pretty substantial fraction. And someone else said this too, not just programming skills, but all the skills that go around programming, like debugging is huge, finding resources, stack overflow is huge. You know, being able to look things, you know, finding things in search engines is, is a skill. Not everybody has it. It can be taught, it can be learned. It's an important part of this whole picture. Reading the documentation. Um, there's also surrounding programming. There's also a software engineering tool set and a mindset that includes things like version control and automated building processes and reproducible science. Uh, agile development, I think, is a really nice thing, a nice skill to give the students. Uh, things like Scrum as a way of organizing teams, tools like uh, Trello and other team management software. Uh, yeah. For those of us who have no idea what you just said, that's <laughs> two minutes and you want to fill us in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some resources in a second to fill in exactly what I just said. But that's, that is, that's, thank you for asking. You're absolutely right. I will explain what those things are. The other, just the other one that I'll mention is, is pair programming. All of these are simultaneously helping students learn to program, but also how to manage a project, how to work in a team, how to organize your time. Uh, so software, I think, can be a really nice tool to develop a lot of other skills. Alan, can pair programming be done virtually, or do students need to be together? Good question. Can you pair program virtually? I think it depends on the technology. If you have reasonable telepresence, it's doable. Okay. Um, but but based, based on the screen? It is certainly best if you're side by side. Part of my answer to how to make room in the curriculum is that it's a little bit like mixing alcohol and water. 
and I don't know if you know about this, but you know, one liter of alcohol plus one liter of water makes about 1.8 liters. Okay. I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like that. They fit inside each other. And the same thing can happen. When you add computation to a class, you might now have 1.5x of the time, but it might be as effective as 2.5 units of time. Um, and so, paradoxically, adding computation, I believe, can actually save space and time. The other is talking about dependencies between classes. Oh, you know, I have to teach blah 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 because the people downstream absolutely depend on blah blah blah. Just go ahead and do it. And wait and see if they even notice. Because honestly, and I believe this, prerequisites currently so don't work that the people downstream will never know what you changed. <laughs> so this is my just go ahead and do it. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission on some of these changes. The other thing, one of the obstacles that came up, people mentioned, you know, look, we don't always know what we need. This is not how we learned. And I think we just have to acknowledge that. We have this idea as professors that we are the font of all knowledge, and that is a sign of weakness to admit that we don't know anything. Which is part of the reason I appreciated your question. When I started speaking Greek, you said, whoa, you know, I'm not a computer scientist. What are, you, what are you talking about? We have to be willing to do that in front of each other and even in front of our students. And that's going to take a cultural shift among us and in the contract between us and the students. But I think it's important. You just have to go learn stuff. I mentioned co-teaching. I think that's huge. I know it's hard because it involves uh, allocating more person hours to a class, and that's a tough sell. But it pays off in a huge way. The other is, I was really excited to see that Software Carpentry was in this room yes yesterday. I think that's a fantastic resource for both us and our students to learn not only the programming part, but, and this is now my answer to your question, which is where do you learn about version control and agile development and all that. One of the things I love about the Software Carpentry carpentry curriculum is it is that whole picture and not just the programming part. So take advantage of resources like that. Speaking of resources, a couple of things I'll point you to. I handed out some books. That is one thing that's helpful. I mentioned software carpentry. I'll also say one nice thing about this workshop is that you have all met each other and I assume that not all of you knew each other before. The people who show up for workshops like this are probably exactly the resources that you can take advantage of. So I hope that having now met, you will keep meeting and, uh, and take advantage of those connections. Uh, yes? So I jump in and, and mention here at DSI, we're facilitating a new um, reading group. It's going to be a fancy name for it. But for folks who are interested in teaching computational skills in the classroom, so coming in, whether you're doing it through a workshop or within your core course that you're routinely teaching, a way for us to share experiences, tips, tricks, things that we've tried that have worked, haven't worked. Um, if you're interested in that, we're starting up a Google group, and I can add you to that. And um, we'll be doing coffee hour type meetups here in this space, probably about every couple of weeks. Great, thank you. And actually, if I get a chance, um, would you send me some information? I will put it into these slides so that if people are coming back to these slides later, they'll have that there. Um, you all probably know that you have a Center for Educational Effectiveness, and they have grants and things like that that are available for curricular development. So if you're thinking about a project, you have some resources here. The other one that I'll mention, uh, at Owen, we run a summer institute which is called Designing Student-Centered Learning Experiences. And it is a program where we bring people in. We typically get about 50 different colleges and universities. Most of them will send a small team with a project. They are working on a curriculum design project. They're often kicking it off at Summer Institute. So they come and we run through a series of workshops that are about curriculum design. And the teams work on those projects while they're at Olin with us as consultants, and then go away and implement what they designed at their institutions. Uh, it's a great chance to take advantage of some of the things that we've done at Olin and some of the things that we think about, but also the other participants, the teams learning, learning a ton 
from each other. Um, I would love it if you all could send a team out to us, but we schedule it very badly. We do this during the first week of June, which is still a lot of your semester is going on. But if there's any way that you can send us out a team, uh, that I think we would love to have you, and I, I think it would be useful to you. Yeah, typical teams that come out, is there, is there a typical, is it within a department, within a college, across the university, what, what, how big is the team? All, all of the above, typically three, three people plus or minus three uh -huh. okay. uh, is the size of the team. Um, and it, it will sometimes be a department doing a particular thing, yeah. it will often be across departments, right. sometimes it's junior faculty doing some crazy new thing. Sometimes it's administrators who want to try to change yeah. big programs. So yeah, real nice. Thanks. We get a few high schools as well as colleges and universities. We also get a, a mixture of domestic and um, international. We get a number of international universities. Mm -hmm. If you are not quite sick of hearing from me, uh, <laughs> I'm giving a talk this afternoon from, from 3 to 4, taking some of the ideas that we've talked about and taking them a little bit farther. We mentioned this idea of using APIs as a way of understanding abstract mathematical entities. I'm going to give a couple more examples of that and some more demonstration of this idea of using code as a language for communicating and learning and teaching and thinking that we tend to think in natural language, express it in mathematical notation, and then go to computation. I think there are ways of turning that around and starting to think directly in terms of computation. Mm -hmm. So that's what that talk is about this afternoon, if you can join us for that. And then lastly, email addresses. We would love to hear from you. Certainly, if you'd like to follow up on any of the things we've talked about, we'd love to hear about it. If you have thoughts about the workshop today, we'd love to hear feedback about things that worked and things that didn't work. We will likely do some versions of this in the future, so we'll make some changes to it. And thank you all very much.